Welcome to CSI Coatesville. In this episode, which is the first part of a two-part series on types of evidence, we're going to focus specifically on eyewitness evidence. In this program, we're going to classify evidence, we're going to consider factors that influence eyewitnesses, and we're going to see how to improve the reliability of eyewitnesses. First, let's look at what's wrong with this lineup. Study this photograph and I'd like you to pause the program just briefly to make a list of the things that you see wrong with this lineup. Now, evidence is classified first by its source. There are basically three sources we're going to look at. First, testimonial evidence. As you can see, these are statements that are made by a competent witness under oath also known as direct evidence or prima facie evidence. Next, physical evidence. That could be any object or material relevant to the crime which tend to prove a fact. We also refer to this sometimes as indirect evidence. And then finally, circumstantial evidence. You may have heard about this in crime show programs. Circumstantial evidence suggests a fact or event but does not strictly prove it. In other words, if you have a variety of circumstantial evidences together, then that can be very significant taken as a whole. Keep in mind, oftentimes these are significant if they are unusual or connected to other types of evidence. What are some factors that would influence an eyewitness, particularly with respect to the incident? itself. The time of day, in other words, was there sufficient light for that witness to see the suspect in the commission of a crime. Also the proximity or closeness to the suspect. Were they standing within 10 or 20 feet? Were they standing next to the perpetrator? Or were they at a distance? Also the actions of the suspect. These are things which the witness is going to tend to remember better than other features about the suspect because we tend to look at the actions of a person rather than, for example, what they're carrying in their hand. The type of crime being committed as well is going to impact a person's memory. Is it something as common as shoplifting or was there violence involved in the commission of the crime? Was a weapon involved as well? Sometimes a witness is going to focus more on that weapon rather than, for example, what the perpetrator was wearing or the color of their eyes. Also, the duration of the observation makes a difference. Is, is the event something that the witness only observed for a few seconds or were they in uh, the same room with that perpetrator for an extended period of time? All these are going to be factors. And the reason why is because the more time a witness actually thinks about the incident, particularly when it's happening, the more likely their memories will be accurate and useful in making an identification. There's also factors that influence the eyewitness with respect to the witness themselves. For example, what about their age? Witnesses that are very young, for example, young children, they may tend to fabricate or make stories up as part of retelling uh, an incident that surrounded a crime. Older people may be able to focus on the details of an incident very well. Their vision may not be as good as someone who's 10 or 15 years younger than they are. The general health of that witness also makes a difference as well. If they have a drug problem, if they are distracted by not feeling well, these are all factors that are going to influence their ability to remember. The response to stress is also very important. Stress is a memory killer. So psychological factors that are going to impact on a person's stress is going to impact upon their ability to remember. When you think about it as well, the similarity of the witness to the suspect can make it a significant impact upon what they can recall about particularly what the perpetrator looked like. For example, a person of the same ethnic background is much easier to recall than someone of an ethnic background that is unusual or not easily seen by that witness. 
because they're not going to recall particular details about that person. With respect to people of unusual ethnicities, we tend to group them together in terms of their appearance. We're not going to recall nuances about their facial features. Also, the relationship to the suspect. If this witness has a prior relationship to the suspect, that can involve a number of factors that are going to impact upon this witness's memory. They may recognize them very well. What if they've been threatened by that perpetrator in the past? This is going to certainly impact the stress and their ability to recall the incident at hand. And is, is this witness not only a witness, but a victim of a sexual assault? Victims of sexual assault tend to relive that assault over and over again in their minds. So they recall very clearly many details of what happened in that incident for the reason that I mentioned earlier, that the more we think about an incident, the more likely we're going to recall details and those details are going to stay intact in long-term memory in our mind. And keep in mind as well that when we're looking at a function of memory, we're talking about an area of cognitive psychology. So we're talking about the physiology as well as the psychology involved in memory. So there's a variety of factors that are going to enter in here. We're talking particularly about the neurons or nerve cells that are in a person's brain and how they function. Keep in mind that those connections between those neurons, which we refer to as synapses, that's actually where these memories are stored. And so in reconstructing the events of a crime, the strength of those connections is going to determine to a large extent what a witness is able to recall. And that's why we refer to memory sometimes as plastic. Not that the brain itself is plastic, but those memories are plastic in the sense that they are moldable, they're subject to change. In other words, we don't record memory the way that I'm recording this video program right now where every part of it is being kept and stored. When we're asked to recall an incident, we're actually recalling bits and pieces here, and then we reconstruct um, as we're recalling that incident, we're reconstructing that memory in our mind from those different elements that these synapses contain. And then the interview by the police. There are factors that influence what an eyewitness is going to say as they give their deposition, as they make a statement to the police in response to the elements of that interview. Let's take a look at some of those as well. The kinds of questions that the investigator is going to ask the witness are going to play a significant role. Are they leading questions? In other words, are they going to, in the incident of a lineup, are they going to direct the witness's attention at one particular person in the lineup? Are they going to ask questions like, was the perpetrator wearing a red coat? Did they have brown hair? Did they wear black shoes? These are all leading kinds of questions. Instead, that investigator should be using open-ended questions. In other words, asking the witness to retell as best as they can what occurred during the incident. And then, is there pressure to identify? For example, if there is a lineup of four or five people, is the investigator making statements like, we know that the perpetrator of the crime is in this lineup. I'd like you to identify them. That's going to put pressure on that witness to make identification when in fact, the person who committed the crime was not in the lineup at all. And then, what about the past history of this witness? Perhaps they've made false identifications in the past. That's going to create a degree of uncertainty in the mind of the witness as well as the investigator on how they're going to proceed with this interview. We also can't forget the fairness of the lineup as well. I'll come back to that in a moment. Remember the picture of the lineup that you saw at the beginning of this program. Are those lineups conducted fairly or the photo spreads? 
Next, the time duration from when the incident occurred to the questioning interview itself. If that's an extended period of time, it's likely that elements of the incident are not likely to be recalled very well. And of course, all of this assumes that you have a witness that is cooperative and sincerely wants to assist the police with the investigation. Keep in mind as well that the witness's prior relationship with the police in general, with authorities, may also impact how they behave during the interview. Now, the witness interview and the lineup. Let's take a look at some principles that can ensure an increased reliability of statements that the witness will make during the interview, what they will be able to recall. First, inform the witness that the perpetrator may not be present in the lineup. That way, no pressure is placed upon them to make an identification when, in fact, that identification is in doubt. Secondly, ensure that participants in the lineup are similar in appearance to the suspect. If we have the suspect in the lineup, we want to make sure that the distractors, in other words, the other participants, are dressed in a similar way, have the similar appearance, have a similar ethnicity, and are of a similar height of the perpetrator as well. And then the lineup or photo spread should be conducted by someone other than the primary investigator. Keep in mind that body language and nuances in, a, in the investigator's speech may impact and communicate information to that witness that may actually be leading the witness. So we want to get that primary investigator uh, out of this process altogether. And then finally, again as we mentioned before, that that investigator is to use open-ended rather than leading or suggestive questions in the process of, of conducting the lineup. Now, at the beginning of the program, you saw a picture of a lineup. I'd like you to again go back to the list that you made at the top of the program and look again at this photograph. Can you add any elements to the list that you already made that you may have missed before watching this program? And as always, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.